got that. Right, so just to uh, give, put some context onto the um, archive that we're building, not building, um, and then I'll hand over to Julie to talk about some of the technical approaches that have been taken to achieve it. So, um, just by way of background, the UK government awards the title of UK City of Culture every four years, um, and in 2017 that title was awarded to Hull. Um, and although we have it for a four year period as a title, um, and events are carrying on, but there is a real focus in the first year of to use that title in order to showcase what the city has to offer, uh, using cultural events to raise the profile and to uh, stimulate regeneration and growth. And uh, we acquired, or acquired, managed to carry, see over 2,800 events across the city during the course of that year. Um, and all of those were being managed by a, uh, a company set up specifically for it called the Culture Company. Um, and the aim is to build an archive of all of those events and the organisation. The aim of it is to, as much as um, well, taking our lead for the archive as much as anything from the, um, the background to why there was the city bid for the city of culture title in the first place. Um, and this is a quote that was taken from the uh, bid that uh, was submitted originally. Uh, the story of a city finding its place in the UK city coming out of the shadows and re-establishing its reputation as a gateway that welcomes the world. The story is of Hull, a city that is proud of its people and wants to share its sense of freedom and space with the rest of the UK. And key to it in terms of thinking about how we're creating an archive for that was that much as the activity was centred on 2017, it, very much from a perspective of continuing that same sense into the future, was that if we could capture the year in an archive, uh, then we would have the wherewithal to be able to continue with that um, demonstration of that and remembrance of that and development of other cultural activity within the city going forward. So that's been the basis for why we wanted to create this archive in the first place. So 2017 happened as a sort of random selection of photographs from activities that took place within the city that year. Uh, great fun it was too. Um, in terms of the records then that we're looking to create the archive around is that they come from various depositors, but primarily from the culture company, um, which was the, as I said, the body that organised the entire um, year. Um, and I suppose what was key towards the creation of this archive is that the records were almost exclusively digital, certainly in terms of all the documents and all the related materials. Yes, there is a physical archive. There are physical art artefacts that are used in some of the events, and they've also been captured and they will be um, part of the archive going forward. But the focus of attention here is recognising that um, this is, um, that the vast majority of records were digital. Um, and they came from two particular systems. One was um, an asset bank, a dam system that had been set up by the culture company, which, and every single project was required to submit photographs of either the preparation, all the materials, all the actual event that took place itself, so that they could be recorded against a record of that event taking place. And that's generated about 18,000 high quality photos and videos from across the year. Um, and then the organisation itself had a SharePoint and captured all of the materials that it had, documents within that, uh, to some of about 80,000 organisational records. We know that from an archival point of view, there is a lot of duplication in there and there's a lot of material we probably wouldn't want to archive at all, but that's our starting point because that's what was in it. Um, and we also have email records as well uh, from the communications that the culture company took part in. So in terms of journey towards an archive, the award was actually made in 2013 and it was from then that we started making the business case to the university about building such an archive. Um, and eventually it became part of the university's commitment to the City of Culture um, and, and supporting it. Um, we then stuck uh, on the basis of that, developed a collaborative relationship with the culture company. And this really was fruitful for us insofar that the culture company, instead of just collecting its materials for the purpose of the business it was running, was consciously thinking about what it was trying to capture so that it could go into the archive beyond 2017. Um, and so that was right through the year itself. Um, that was the thing that informed asking all the artists to make sure they provided the photographs 
It also meant that um, everyone was asked, with the Brits, different levels of success, everyone was asked when they created files in SharePoint to tag them using keywords and provide metadata around them. So it's a relatively rich set of data that we have, fortunately, to start working with. Um, we then proceeded with uh, developments using it by tendering uh, for archive development um, back in the last year. Um, and centered that around the use of Samvira, and that was largely because, as a university, of course, we had a very strong interest and role in the development of Samvira. We have an existing repository that's based on previous Hydra um, software. Um, and we wanted to see the development of this archive as a sort of step up uh, to helping us to make better use of more recent Samvira software, and also establish an infrastructure which would allow us to work with this archive but also with the potential to expand it to use it for other archives and other materials as well. And on that basis, the co sector was successful in their tender, and I'll hand over to Julie to talk about the work they're taking forward. Thank you, Jeff. Um, when we were responding to the tender, we um, decided to partner with Cottage Labs, who um, some of you will probably uh, encounter before. So Cottage Labs had already worked with Hull on um, a, pro a project previous to this called the, the Filling, Filling the Digital Preservation Gap project. It was from the Digest. Um, I, in my previous job at the University of York, worked, worked on the same project uh, in collaboration with Hull. So that kind of made us ideally placed to understand what, what Hull were trying to do and to to get cr cracking with the project pretty pretty swiftly. Um, so the brief, as, as, as Chris has already explained, was build a digital archive of city of culture and preferably do that with Sambera and Archivematica. So just very briefly, this was the, the sort of user flow that we proposed. Um, we'll have a subscription to a cloud provider called Box. So, um, one of the routes to get data into the archive was, was via box. Uh, the other, uh, just by um, files on the local desktop of the art list. And then the idea um, that we proposed was to push those files through a transfer location into Archivematica. Archivematica chews over them and then spits out a preservation ape into the ape store and the dissemination package into the dip store. At that point, we wanted to push that, that, those dissemination files into a hierarchy so that IROX could act, act as the uh, presentation there for dissemination files uh, and their selector about about the city of culture and that would provide the public interface. Uh, but then we talked. So this is a really interesting point for me that when you're filling out a tender, you, you're constrained and, you, and you're responding to a set of requirements that are presented to you, but often when you actually sit down and talk to people, that's not quite the right approach and other things come into play and, and the ability to be flexible is, I think, really important. And, and the strength of the relationship we, we had with Paul allowed us to kind of sit down, diagram out what was actually going on at Paul, think about the future of, of the, the work we were doing. And, and we actually changed the shape and size of, of the project a little bit to bring in um, two systems that are already in place. One is Car, which is um, an archives cataloging solution that's I don't know whether it's particularly used in the States, but it's widely used in the UK. And then the other is uh, the Hull History Centre catalogue, um, which is based on Black Light. So, I want to now just spend quite a bit of time working through the design of the solution. And I use this kind of iceberg thing as, uh, to try and show how, how we've worked to uh, keep the, the technical complexity away from the end users and the archivists. So, our start, starting point is kind of the, end, the, the member of the public who wants to, to look at this archive. Um, and because the Hall History Centre, who look after these records, already have a, a, an archival catalogue interface, we kind of thought, well, maybe that should be the, the, the primary place where people come to, instead of a, a second interface onto this. Um, so that's what we agreed. And so then, in terms of getting to the archives catalogue and getting to the digital objects, that's all the public need to know about. They're not skipping around different systems. That's not to say we won't, there won't be more work done on sort of presentation or online exhibitions or things like that, but this is a sort of primary routine. 
And this is different from the original scope. And then we have the archivists who have to work on this content. And the archivists have a bunch of uh, files and folders and some spreadsheets of information sitting in a uh, local file store or box. And then on the other side, the archivists are already cataloging into the CARM system. And in terms of the archivists, that's, that's all we really want them to have to interact with in a sort of required way. There are other systems they can interact with, but they don't have to. So then, from this starting point, we start to design the solution. So we wanted Hyrax to be um, a component part of this because it's a, it's a technology that we we'll already use, um, and it, it, it fits the needs of looking after those dissemination copies really well. That's what it's good at, looking after files and making them available. And then we, we propose to, to keep Archivematica in this, in this design, which was the original design, because Archivematica is a, a digital preservation system and we wanted to preserve these contents. So obviously now the question is, how do we get from uh, the stuff sitting on someone's local desktop into Archivematica and Hyrax without anyone having to do loads of manual hard labour? Um, and then we want Archivematica obviously to push out the data into its, its AP dip stores. So we propose to build a, 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 I think this is a great name, it sounds like a Arnold Schwarzenegger thing, a <laughs> synchronizer. Um, so we, we, we wanted to build a, a fairly lightweight application that acts as the glue between these systems. Um, so obviously the next step is to tie it all together. So the way this all works, in a, in a fairly simplified way, is the archivist um, shares a folder that has been structured in a particular way with a, a, a box account that is managed by this whole synchronizer application. The whole synchronizer then picks up that data, pushes it over to Archive Massacre. It then, once the dip has been created, it pulls back the dip, pushes that into Hyrax, and then it updates metadata in CARM so that CARM knows that we've got digital objects for this archive. And then up at the top there, there's already a pathway for the whole history centre catalogue to, to index um, the EAD, EAD record or records that come out of CARM. So then the thing we need to have is the ability for those um, catalogue records to, to pull in and display digital files when they're available and then they're unrestricted. So that's basically the architecture. So I think I'm okay for time, so I'll talk a little bit about this. This was just I think the slide isn't quite as sexy as I wanted it to be, but I just wanted to try and sort of show how how a deposit kind of comes in and what it looks in, like in all the different places. So if we have a, a, a collection, um, a, a, a set of items, so that each of those items is like a folder or a file, and a, we have a file called description CSV. That contains a row for each of the objects we want to ingest into Hyrax. That will go into the AIP with some extra stuff, so it will be structured in the AIP in a particular way, um, and it, we will create this directory called package. So we wanted to be able to capture all of the things that are part of the original deposit in a in a kind of clear way. So we, we kind of group all this stuff into this directory called package, and then over in the dip you don't get so much. You get you just get the files. So at that point in in file sort and you've lost all the knowledge of what was in the folders and all that kind of thing, but that's, that information is sitting inside a METS file in there. So we use that then to derive these Hyrax objects. So we create a package object and that's essentially like a, a, a receipt, it's a trace back to what, what happened in Archive Massacre. So on that object we'll have the original description file that went in, we'll have the METS file that Archive Matica produced. And so that allows us to, to know um, when it went in, where it is in Archivematica, where the archival copy is, and it allows us to track all that information. And then the items come in. I've got an extra bit of this. Um, so that's the package. So then the items come in like this. So um, we create Hyrax objects that will have one or more files, depending on the structure of the original. And then the way we connect together CARM and, and and the, um, the CARM record is through the idea of the folder. So we'll create a, we'll update an existing collection in CARM and we'll create some item records based on, on the objects um, 
that we're ingesting. The idea of in, at the calm side is we're not going to try and represent any kind of archival structure in calm because we want to get this stuff in fast. We don't want the archivist to, to leave it on their desktop because they haven't got time to arrange it or think about how it's going to be structured. So, so the motivation here is let's make it easy to get it into Archivematica, get it into Hyrax, and get a basic piece of information in Carl. And then it doesn't really matter how long it takes for the archivist to, to do that cataloging work. The, ca the archivist is in control of when this goes public in the catalog because, the, because they basically press a button to publish that record. So we can have everything managed and uh, looked after well before it, it gets made public. The danger, of course, is it never gets made public. That would make me an illusion who works on this very sad, but it will. Um, and then we tie together the Hyrax items and the CALM records by basically putting an ID to the Hyrax record into those CALM items. And that's the thing that we'll be using the Blacklight interface to say, oh, we have digital objects, let's pull them in into a nice view up here. I don't know what those circles are about, but they're nice, aren't they? Um, so that's everything I have to say. One, just one quick last point is one of the motivations for Hull here is how will this architecture scale to their other use cases? So Hull have a is an institutional repository based on um, Sophia. Pre that. Pre Sophia. Um, so at some point that needs to migrate. Um, so we think this ar architecture can. Um, extend to that use case so you could start to use the Hyrax for so you could have a public front end as well in the Hyrax instance that was presenting only the, the institutional repository contents but not the um, archive and collection contents. You could have a separate blacklight instance over the top of that. Archivematic could be used for more material. Uh, the, the way we've designed the process goes way beyond what will be coming in from the whole city of culture. So we really wanted to try and make this extensible. Uh, the current status of this is that all of these pieces are in the prototype. So we've got the we've got one little blocker at the moment with box. Um, so we have not quite got the box sharing bit working, but we're working on that. So I'm hoping that within maybe a week we'll have a full kind of end-to-end -end share folder goes through the synchronizer process into Hyrax, metadata in Carl. Uh, that'll be a, a day for the champagne. And so I'll hand back to Chris. Um, to just finish, finish off with a few final thoughts. Okay, um, so just to reiterate, I suppose, is um, what we see the archive is delivering. We clearly see it as delivering us an archive of the City of Culture, which will allow us to use it for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Um, but clearly, the aim was to also recognize that instead of just provide, creating a solution for that use case, was to try and create a solution that we could use for other purposes as well. Um, primarily, I suppose, that's the archives um, wishing to be able to manage other archival collections that they have amassed. Um, like I think in a lot of archives are probably in the situation of now, they're amassing digital files, but not necessarily with the web of knowing what to do with them. Uh, if we can repurpose this architecture to help with that, then that would be very helpful as well, I'm sure. Um, I just put up, I mean, this is the poster I had yesterday, but it just is my sort of current take on it. The left hand side is essentially the same as the pyramid uh, that um, Judy drew, drew, drew on her slide. Um, but the idea of architecture will provide them with a nice uh, safe home for the archive files, but there are still all the archival tasks to undertake of appraisal, cataloguing, and actually then determining how and you can provide access to different parts of it. and. Um, to what extent you do provide access to different parts of it depending on the permissions. Um, technically, um, this is very much a development project and we're working at the moment on how to move that into service in terms of the hosting and support of ongoing development. Um, and that's related into developing the business case for it, which is as much linked into what we can do with the broader collection management tasks as it is for this existing archive. Um, and also potentially identifying revenue opportunities because as a university, we're developing we develop this architecture. There's, we know that there are organisations in the region which don't have access to that type of um, service uh, and therefore we're interested in having conversations with them about how this type of service might give benefit to them more widely. Okay, so stop there. So thank you. Uh, thank you to Julie, thank you to uh, everyone.
everyone for listening, and I'd also like to give thanks to Laura, our digital archivist, for uh, so, because many of those slides get started with her. Happy to take questions.
rather than just to know about the dissemination companies and that's what Harris is doing. So actually we've disassociated our kind of aspect from um, Palm, um, which is different to how our kind of space works. I think we should have a more direct integration. And the reason we did that is because um, we've got Harax in the middle looking after sort of assets, so it's Harax that knows what's in our kind of aspect and Harax that knows where the dissemination companies are. So that Harax Thank you very much indeed for your attention this morning and enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks everyone.